All right. Hebrews chapter 10, and then we'll look at verse 5. Verse 5. The Bible says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. So, recall that in verse 1 through 4, is about Old Testament animal sacrifices cannot take away sins. Because of that, that's why verse 5 is saying, that's why when Jesus came to the world, he actually said that to God the Father, sacrifice and offerings, you won't receive it. You won't count it as perfect salvation, as perfect forgiveness. Remember, they did receive forgiveness in the Old Testament because Jesus didn't die on the cross yet because there is no perfect sacrifice. So God would count it, but it's imputation. He would count it, one, and number two, it's, temp it's temporary. It's temporal, okay? So that was an imperfect, incomplete forgiveness. So God cannot receive that as complete. But what God can receive is the body that he prepared for his son Jesus, which is why Jesus said, you prepared a body for me. That way I can become the complete sacrifice. Now the verse that he's quoting from is from the book of Psalms. So go to Psalm chapter 40, Psalm 40. Now, I'm going to show you an error in your Bible. Now, not just the King James, but actually Bible itself. This is probably the best verse, uh, one of the best verses you can use, where you can prove that the authors, that they were manipulating verses, perhaps. So there's a criticism called redactor criticism. There's a lot of uh, criticisms within biblical criticism, textual criticism, literary, um, uh, historical criticism, reader response criticism, blah, 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 criticism, 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 okay? So the scholars pull up all these terms so that, why? That's how much they hate your Bible, okay? So they make a living, they spend all day long just to, what? Criticize the Word of God. What a life. You know, if you don't even believe it, why do you live your whole life that way, right? But anyway, so one of the things in literary or biblical criticism that people who despise the Word of God they might use this verse on you. So notice that if Paul is the author and he's writing this verse, then this is the verse that he's quoting from the psalmist in Psalm chapter 40 and verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Now notice that Jesus Christ said to the Father, you didn't want sacrifice and offering, so you prepared a body for me. But that's not what it says in the original Hebrew, if that's what you want to say. It says right here, mine ears hast thou open. See that? Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then this sounds like that Paul manipulated the verse to try to argue for the Messiah. That there is a sacrificial Messiah, son of God. Because he totally changed the meaning right here. So that's uh, one of... A possible arguments they might use to show a contradiction in the Bible. So this is, notice right here, we're not talking about error in King James. I'm talking about error in the Greek, if you want to believe in the original Greek New Testament. Because the author, notice in Hebrews, he is intending to argue about Jesus or the Son of God manifesting himself into human form. Okay? So that's what the author is deliberately intending when he's writing in Greek in the New Testament. Now remember, in the New Testament, it was originally written in Greek. The Old Testament is originally written in Hebrew. It's not English King James, if some of you thought so. Sorry, all right? It wasn't English King James. That wasn't the originals that time. So if that's the case of the intention of the author to argue that the Son of God, Jesus, took upon human flesh to become a sacrifice for us, we don't see an inkling of that in Psalm 40, verse 6. The intention of the author, it looks like, in Psalm 40, verse 6, is that indeed God would not receive the sacrifices, but what 
God would want is basically the person's submission at verse 6. Mine ears hast thou opened. See that? So the person's submission. That's what they might argue. Now, there are several arguments that can debunk the critics who try to show the contradiction with these two verses. The first thing to understand is we have to realize, remember that the author was translating from Hebrew to Greek. So notice right here, body prepared, right? He is going from Hebrew to Greek. When you take even the Hebrew itself, it's actually a weird translation if you were to take it literally. Literal translation even by itself goes dug out ears, which is very strange. And that's obvious the author or the psalmist didn't intend it that way, <laughs> dug out ears. So when you're working on this translation, it can work either way. This is what must be understood, and this is common sense within translations. When you're translating for somebody, not every single time can you do literal word for word. Now, don't get me wrong, as King James Bible believers, we believe in literal translation, but we don't believe what I like to call it is literal jargon, if that makes any sense to you. So we don't believe in literally translating every single word where it doesn't make sense. It's jargon, not a translation then. And that's not a proper translation if you do everything literally. So what we believe is translating in, as King James Bible believers, literally as much as possible. That's what we would like to argue. So then the question is, if we want to do it that way, then why can't we just translate verse 6 as a body has thou prepared for me, right? With Hebrews. Now, some people or some, uh, oh, how do I say this? Some people who believe in the LXX, they would claim that, oh, so that's why it's uh, translated in the Greek LXX as a body has thou prepared for me. Now me, I don't believe in LXX. Now some of you are going, what is LXX? LXX is supposedly a Greek Old Testament that the Jews had a long time ago. But me, I don't believe in that. That's nonsensical. I believe it's origins hexapla, or basically it was a fake old Greek Old Testament, Amen. which was very common during the old days to have fake Bibles anyway. That was very, very rampant. But whether you believe in LXX or not, it doesn't matter. How we can debunk this argument is as follows. So remember again that what we're concentrating is correct translation here. So if it's a correct translation, then, we, then it is incorrect to say that the author incorrectly translated it. So even if we see right here where words seem to be very different, if nevertheless, it can be translated correctly like that, then you cannot condemn it as an incorrect translation. The bottom line is this, is that what builds up our faith in the Word of God more is not where we find a right doctrine or a right meaning, if that makes any sense to you. What do I mean by that? Then the authors would be biased. What do I mean by that? If they translated from one language to another, where they want to put the exact meaning to them, the right doctrinal intention to them, then it's a biased translation. But if they were to look at one translation to another and simply focused on, look, let's not focus on the, uh, what is the right doctrine or the right meaning right here. Let's focus on what's the proper translation. See that? So even if it doesn't uh, make sense meaning-wise or doctrine-wise, if it's a correct translation, let it stand that way. That's the whole idea. So this proves more in the infallibility of your Bible because they did not go by their own biased belief on what the verse should mean. Because if it was you and me, it would be obvious when we look at Psalm, we would translate that as a body has thou prepared for me. 
But an honest translator, when he's going from Hebrew to one language, he's going to translate it exactly as it says. So here's the thing. When we go from Hebrew to English, it can go ears open. But what do you do when Hebrew to Greek to English? See that? So you're going through two hurdles of languages here. In Hebrew to Greek, when you go dug out ears, you can, in a sense, go body prepared. In other words, a body or, e uh, or ears, which is part of a body, is being formed. That it can be a correct translation from Hebrew to Greek. And then when we do it in English, we have to go body prepared. If we look at the author himself, Paul, he would view the ear as part of the body. So if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. Notice right here that the Apostle Paul, if he's the writer of the book of Hebrews, he can say in verse 16, 1 Corinthians 12, 16, and if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? See, Paul himself, the author, thinks that they're simultaneous. They're the same. So if he had that in mind, when he translated it this way, that is perfectly fine. That is perfectly fine. When you go dug out years literally, you can translate this in several ways. See that? When you go literally in Hebrew, dug out years, that's too confusing. So a translator is free to go by as long as it is a correct translation, as much freedom as they're allowed to translate correctly, they can do that. So they have the right to translate however way they want, as long as it's correct. And it is not incorrect what the author did from Hebrew to Greek. If you go to the original Hebrew, which that is debatable anyway, we don't even know if that's the original, but if we were to go by the Hebrew manuscripts, translate that into Greek. You cannot disprove the Greek author on how he wrote that. You can't. Because when you look at that word, it's so, it can be translated in several different ways. The bottom line is this. The bottom line is if it's a correct translation, then the word of God is correct in its translation. It's that simple. But if he was to, if he was to do everything, that would match up Psalm and Hebrew from Hebrew, Greek, and English, if everything was to be precisely done that way, one, that's not realistic in translation process. If a person who would understand that is if they're multi-tongued, okay, multi-languages. Two, if it was done that way, then we would see more as a biased author. See that? But we can see the honesty of the author and the translator if they simply translated it where it's not precisely word for word on all three languages. See that? So this should prove more on the honesty or the, even the correctness and the authenticity of this verse. That's what it should prove more. If that makes any sense to you, I hope that you can understand that. So if we went by what the author wants to match up everything, and then he has a doctrine or a meaning in mind, and then he wants to attend it that way, then it's just going to show bias right here. But if he simply went by, look, this is how it says in Hebrew, I can translate this into Greek, then we see honest translation here. So that's pure translation. Now here's another thing to understand. Another thing to understand, within biblical criticism, they recognize this. So even if it's not word for word, within biblical criticism, if the content itself, so I mentioned about meaning and doctrine, right? Where it doesn't have to be word for word. But even if it's not word for word, a meaning and a doctrine can be retained. The content can be retained without word for word. The reason why is this. Notice right here, dug out ears, we have no idea what the meaning is. 
But we see right here, ears open, body prepared, right? When we look at this, we can see what the meaning is. The meaning, let's look at the context again, okay? So we'll look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and then verse 5, right? A body hast thou prepared for me. That's why he has no pleasure in sacrifice and burnt offerings. And then verse 7, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. All right, so the idea is service here. Service. When we look at Psalm 40, all right, keep your hand there, go to Psalm 40. And then verse 6, mine ears hast thou open, right? So that means God wants their listening, their submission, or their service. That is proven again in verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Well, that's pretty plain in Psalm. It's pretty plain in Psalm that what the Lord wants is their service. That's what he means by ears open. A body hast thou prepared for me in Hebrews is the same meaning, that I want your service. The evidence is given when we look at Ephesians 6 and then Exodus 21. Ephesians 6 and Exodus 21. Now remember that Jesus Christ, when he came down on this earth, when he took on that human body, the Bible says he became a servant. Yeah. All right, now there are three places then. I'll have to show that to you, okay? Ephesians 6, Exodus 21, and Philippians 2, all right? Philippians 2. So when Jesus took on that human body, that was automatically considered to be service or being a servant. Now look at Philippians chapter 2. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the what? The form of a what? Servant. We know what that means. When he be took on human body, he became a servant. Now notice what this ear and this body has to do with servants in the Old Testament. Go to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, look at verse 5, Ephesians 6, verse 5. The Bible says, servants, right? Be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service and men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the what? Will of God from the heart. Remember Psalm and Hebrews pointed out that when Jesus Christ took on human flesh, or when the psalmist mentioned about ears being open, that had to do with following God's will. Here's another thing. In Ephesians 6, didn't that servant or the slaves, they have to have their ears open? They have to get their ears open to listen to the commands of God. Now, here's another thing. This is similar with a uh, body being prepared, because look at Exodus 21. Go to Exodus 21. Notice right here, the servant gives his body, prepares his body in servant for the master, and a part of that is his ear getting bore through. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Go to Exodus chapter 21. Notice right here in verse 5, verse 5, And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. So notice when the servant wants to give his body, he wants to prepare his body in service to his master, then his ear would be bore through. So notice right here that the meaning and the content itself is retained. And within biblical criticism, they do realize that when you do translation, you can't do everything word for word. But it is still a correct translation as long as the meaning and the content is the same. So we argue right here this. One, we've proven right here 
that the meaning and content is preserved, but also at the same time, we notice right here the author didn't have a bias of the meaning and content, otherwise he would have done it word for word. He did an honest translation. So this different wording in Hebrews should prove even more so on the infallibility of your Bible and the correctness of translation and even the meaning and content. So it argues for that way. So that can be done as well. If the KJ, think about it, if the KJV translators uh, translated it word, translated it to the way they wanted it, it would been it would have been an incorrect translation. They had to translate correctly from what Greek said. Right. Body. They can't just put ear open. They had to do what Hebrew said. Uh, ear open, not body. If they switched the wording, then you would have seen bias already. That's why LXX can be condemned as bias if they really did that. That would be pretty strange. Okay, let's go back to Hebrews. Now, there's one more argument to actually go, go around this, believe it or not. Another thing, when we look at Hebrews chapter 10, the verse did not say it is written or the, what the scripture said. See that? It's Jesus speaking at verse 5. Jesus was the one speaking to the Father. It didn't say the scripture said, it's what Jesus said. So Jesus was speaking to the Father. In what way? Jesus was speaking through Scripture, what the psalmist did, but he put his word into it to the Father, not the psalmist who was writing out the psalm. Because, believe it or not, it is very common for Jesus Christ to use scriptural wordings. So Jesus Christ, he would use scriptural wordings when he talks. Quite often that is the case. Why? Because Scripture is the Word of God and Jesus is God. So wouldn't it be natural for Jesus? Let's be realistic here. If Jesus was up in heaven talking to the Father, you don't think that he's not going to quote Scripture to the Father? He might use some Scripture passages when he's talking to the Father. That's very logical. So what I'm trying to argue right here is that in verse 5, this does not necessarily have to be a cross-reference to the book of Psalm. The author of Hebrews did not intend to quote Psalm, but rather, more exactly, what Jesus was saying to the Father. What happened when Jesus was speaking to the Father, it just so happened to be mingled with some words in Psalm. It's that simple. Why? Because Jesus sees David as a typology of him. So it would be natural if you're going to think about seriously Jesus Christ up in heaven who takes typologies very seriously. Wouldn't it be natural for him if David or whoever the psalmist was that wrote out that passage since it is the word of God. That means that's Jesus' word that when Jesus whenever he's doing conversations up in heaven he might not be uh, using words that are similar to scripture or what was written down here on earth. That's what must be taken account of. So we'll look at, let's see right here, Matthew. Go to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Notice right here that Jesus Christ sees in one portion of Psalm that it's not David, but rather it is uh, Jesus Christ himself. Notice when we look at Matthew 22, uh, verse 42, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Yeah. You know why? It's very simple because Jesus Christ sees himself through David quite often. But it's in reality the Son of God, not David himself, not the psalmist. So how do we not know in Hebrew that's not the psalmist, but that's actually Jesus Christ himself, right? So we have to understand that. All right, go back to Hebrews. Let's 
What we saw so far content retained, translation not debunked, but more proven. It was more proven. And then we also saw that not necessarily was the author referring to Scripture. It could have been Jesus speaking here. So Jesus was the one speaking, not the psalmist. Okay, now we're going to go to Hebrews again. In verse 6, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Self-explanatory, God the Father is not pleased with burnt offerings and sacrifices uh, for sin. Verse 7, then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. So Jesus says to God the Father that lo is another word for hey, that's the idea. It's one of the words where, hey, pay attention to this part. Uh, I come to do your will, God. So Jesus calls the Father God. And he says that his coming, or a lot of the stuff that was written about him, was found in the Bible. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. Now, these verses from verse 5 and then uh, through 8, we have seen that they are established by and they, uh, that they match with the book of Psalm. But like I told you before, it could be Jesus speaking. And then he just happens to use uh, some language in the Psalm. But continuing on, what's very interesting about this part is it seems like that Jesus himself recognizes that there is the book. In other words, the Bible. Now, I want you to go to Revelation 22 then. Revelation 22. In other words, when Jesus looks at the Old Testament, he doesn't see this as manuscripts oh, all scattered. Right. He sees them as all one collection, as one book, the Bible. The Bible means the book. Amen. So in Revelation 22, God says this. He doesn't want you to add to the Bible or to subtract from the Bible. When you go to Revelation chapter 22, the Bible points out right here a strong condemnation uh, right here. Verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. So notice right here, God doesn't want you to add or subtract from the Bible. Now, the textual critics uh, and the modern Bible version translators, they know that. Yeah. So then that's why they're saying, oh, uh, because they're guilty of obviously doing that, right. adding, subtracting words in the Bible. So then they're saying, no, 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 it's talking about the book of Revelation. Yeah, yeah, right. Because you don't understand that there were so many different manuscripts out there. So when the author says book, he doesn't mean the Bible that you got in your hand, all 66 books. He's talking about just the book of Revelation. Well, one, that's a dumb argument because, yeah, then don't add or subtract from the book of Revelation. Why do you do that? Because <laughs> that's a dumb argument. Number two is how do you not know when you match it up with Psalm and Hebrews, notice right here, in the volume of the book, it's written of me. What do you think Jesus meant by that? I don't think he meant one book of the Bible. It's pretty obvious. He meant the entire Old Testament prophets, but he called it the book. So, yeah, you know what I think? I think God thought the Bible right here. He was exactly thinking about the Bible. So in Revel if that's his personality where he said that before at Hebrews, why do you change that at Revelation 22? I thought you're all about exegesis, you know, don't insert your eisegesis, you know, you got to go by context. So says these textual critics and these Bible scholars who deny the inspiration of the King James Bible. Well, why don't you be consistent then with your exegesis right here? 
Hebrews was earlier. Psalm was way earlier. What do you think they were talking about? Just one manuscript? No, they were obviously talking about the entire books of the Old Testament uh, prophets. The Bible. Let's just call it the Bible, man. All right, let's go back. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And then verse 8. Above when he said, Sacrifice an offering and burnt offerings, an offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Okay, th that's a mouthful there, so let me go one by one. So when the author says above when he said, he could be probably uh, be referring to what I mentioned before at verse 5. So what I mentioned previously there, above there. That could be what he's uh, writing there. He says that sa all the sacrifices, offering, burnt offerings, and offering for sin, God wouldn't take that as complete or perfect salvation forgiveness. God didn't have pleasure in those things, which is offered by the law. The law demanded that. So then Jesus Christ says to the Father, he reasons out, so uh, lo, that's the idea of uh, an a word that mentions about paying attention to what I'm saying here. I'm going to do your will, O God. And so when he comes down on this earth to fulfill God's will, which we already know, it's when he died on the cross, he took away the first that he may establish the second. What's the context of that? The context of what we saw earlier is the first and second covenant. See that? Or testament. During this uh, entire timeline of the Old Testament, this is known as the first. And then the New Testament is known as the second. Takes away the first covenant so that he can establish the second covenant through his sacrifice and death. Now, let me clarify this part here. You might recall when I said first and second covenant, when I word it that way, then it shouldn't be Old Testament, New Testament. What we're going to naturally think, first covenant, second covenant, recall Hebrews 8, right? It is for the nation of Israel. Under the law of Moses, during the first covenant, you're bound by the law of Moses, and I'm going to establish a nation with you. But because you broke it, you failed. That's why I gave up the nation of Israel. So then this second covenant is done through Jesus Christ. And because Jesus Christ died on the cross, he established the second covenant. He can be the messianic king to start a new nation with Israel. And that applies to the millennium sometime in the future. So remember, that's first and second covenant. But what we're seeing right here is undoubtedly Old Testament and New Testament here for first and second covenant in this passage. So what's the confusion? Is there inconsistency? Are you contradicting yourself? Were those Calvinists right then, Pastor, that from Hebrews chapter 8 through 10, it's all about Old Testament, New Testament? So it's only a partial truth. Remember, we got to break it down again. We forgot this. So the whole point of the author is to contrast Jesus Christ from the law of Moses. That's the whole bottom line. From, you can't just look at Hebrews 8 through 10. You have to look at all the way from the beginning, right? Hebrews 2 all the way through the end. He's trying to contrast law of Moses with Jesus Christ. When he does that, he mentions about Hebrews 8, first covenant, second covenant. Then when we get to Hebrews 9, we see Old Testament, New Testament. Then when we get to Hebrews 10, we see first covenant, second covenant again, but that matches with Old Testament, New Testament. In explaining all of this, remember, let me draw it out so that we can explain. There's an Old Testament 
and there's a New Testament. Within the New Testament, there are covenants. And then within the Old Testament, there are covenants. And that is undoubtedly true because we saw those verses, right? In the Old Testament, it's not just one covenant. There were so many different covenants. Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant. And then we saw uh, Davidic covenant, etc. New Testament, we see the different covenants with the Jews and then the Gentiles. We see two sides to this. So there are different ways to establish the covenants. However, because we recognize that when the author is speaking, he's just simply generalizing. When he's generalizing, all he's thinking about is two sides, law of Moses and Jesus Christ. That's all he's thinking about. But when we look at the details, when he's contrasting first and second, See, the details are more shown. Hebrews 8, it's more specified with the nation of Israel. Then in Hebrews 9, it's more specified with Jesus dying on the cross as Old Testament, New Testament. Then in Hebrews 10, it's more specified with the individual, not the nation. All right. Notice right here that when we look at Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews 10, in verse 10, verse 11, 12, 13, these are all individuals receiving salvation, right? That's concentrated on. But when you look at Hebrews 8, and then verses 7 through 11, uh, 7 through 12, that is national. That is national. And that was already proven in our previous he Hebrew study, which I don't have to. But like an example right here is Hebrews 8, 12, right? Sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Well, let's, ref let's assume that's an individual salvation. That will make sense because we saw Romans 11. We saw Daniel 9 earlier. That, the nation, that this is a national forgiveness of sins that cannot happen until the millennium. God is putting them by a specific timeline and clock. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't match Hebrews 8, 12 with an individual salvation. But when you go to Hebrews 10 and then verses uh, 9 through 13, it shows right here it's not by a time clock where, hey, someday in the future God will forgive the whole nation of their sins. No, that's not the idea. A person can receive that forgiveness of sins now. See, that's very, very different. So simply speaking, in Hebrews 2 through 10, the author is simply contrasting G the works of Jesus Christ and the law of Moses, how his covenant is better than Moses or the Jews during their covenant. Then in Hebrews 8, he specifies certain benefits of that. Then in Hebrews 9 and 10, he specifies other different benefits out of that. So that's what we've got to understand here. So the author of Hebrews, he can't be thinking about one specific thing, just simply first covenant, second covenant, and that uh, everyone can receive forgiveness of sins. That's not how he's specifically thinking, because when we look at Hebrews 8, this is a national salvation. This is a national forgiveness of sins at some time in the future. What we have to understand is the author here, when he's talking about these different covenants with Jews and then Jesus Christ, he is showing all the various specific benefits that can come out of that. That makes way more sense. And the easiest proof is by what we saw in context from Hebrews 2 all the way onward. The author, he's not repeating stuff. He's showing Here's one benefit, here's another benefit, another benefit, another benefit, another benefit. So he's giving a lot of different specific benefits of what Jesus established a better covenant than the old. So that's what we must understand right here. Okay, so when we go back to Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, and then verse 9, we can see here he's talking about the first covenant versus the second covenant. And then in this case, it is... What we saw right here, Old Testament, New Testament. 
And by the way, let me say this. Even if we get rid of the word testament and put covenant instead from Hebrews 10, 9, and 8, and let's all assume that it's just covenant, covenant, first covenant, second covenant, first covenant, second covenant. There is no doubt when you read Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 9, the covenant's operations are different in those two chapters, okay? Doesn't change that fact. All right, when we go back right here in uh, verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stand, standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Okay, let me explain each and every word. This whole passage is the best passage to condemn the Roman Catholic Mass. Mm -hmm. This is the standard text you want to know and use. Amen. Explaining each and every word from verse 10 through 14. So from this particular will that Jesus Christ followed, that's which will, all of us become sanctified through what? The body of Jesus Christ that was offered on the cross. And when he offered his body, that was once for all time. You understand that? Once for all time. So the Catholic Mass right here, they constantly sacrifice Jesus Christ's body. But notice that this constant sacrifice contradicts this one sacrifice well, you know, it was one sacrifice, but then uh, it was during that time. No, this is for all time right here. Yeah. Notice right here, one sacrifice for all time. So Jesus Christ is not going to die again. In other words, this covers all dispensations, okay? Yeah. So Jesus Christ only died once. He only died at one time in one dispensation, all right? To insist that his sacrifice is repeated many times, then those Catholics are dispensationalists or hyper-dispensationalists, okay? <laughs> In verse 11, we see that every priest that stands, he has to do it daily, those animal sacrifices. And these animal sacrifices are the same sacrifices that they minister. They offer oftentimes, so many times. And those things can never take away sins. You believe priests exist today? That's what Catholics teach? Well, notice right here then, then this priest, they can do it all day long and that will never take away sins. That's pretty bad for them. The author says here, every priest standeth uh, every day, you know, and they offered the constant same sacrifice, but it never takes away the sins. If you believe that there is such a thing as priests with their rituals today. All right, verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So, however, this man, Jesus Christ, which is a different sacrifice, after he offered one sacrifice for sins, and that was done forever, then he sat down on God's right hand. And when he sat down on God's right hand, he, from henceforth, ever since that time, he's still sitting there. He's not leaving there. He's going to sit there until all of his enemies on earth become his footstool. They're under his control. Well, obviously, we know when Jesus Christ will rule on this earth and control all these nations is at the millennium. So till then, he can't get off his throne. Who does this guy think he is? He can get Jesus Christ off of his throne and land on a piece of cookie. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating here. I'm not joking. They literally teach that. that in Latin, when they're, when they're doing their mass, they are telling God to leave heaven, get off of his throne from heaven, and to enter this piece of cookie that's going to go down the toilet anyway to offer himself as a sacrifice again. And this is the body and blood of Jesus Christ that was offered for you and I, and everyone bow down like a bunch of suckers, and they think that's a real thing. Blasphemy. That is blasphemy in the word of God. In the verse, 
He can't get off his throne. Come on. Yeah. Who does this guy think he is? He think he got the power? I'd be scared to death if I were him. How dare he? You can't get God off his throne. Who does he think he is? That's why this is a very wicked religion. Come on, amen. Very nice people. Don't get me wrong. Nicer than me or you. But nevertheless, it's still a wicked religion. Amen. Wicked religions, wicked systems, any wicked system can have very nice people. Don't let niceties fool you and think, oh, you must be of the truth because you're nice. No, I might have a bad mood that day. What are you going to do then? I, I, when I teach to you, I'm in a bad mood. You're going to go, oh, because he's not nice. He must be lying to me. He must be not telling the truth. Come on, man. You didn't come here to uh, believe due to my personality. You came to believe because you want to know what's truth here. That's the whole bottom line. So he's in the wrong. He can't get Jesus Christ off his throne. And another thing, which is dirty of the Catholics, okay? You'll notice that when you look at verse 12, offered one sacrifice for sins forever, comma, right? That's what your King James Bible says, right? You know what some Catholic Bibles do? After he had offered one sacrifice for sins, comma, <laughs> Forever sat down on the right hand yeah. of God. Well, that is rotten. Yeah. You know why? Because they don't want to say this one sacrifice is forever. They want to say that Jesus Christ sitting on his throne was forever, but not the one sacrifice. Hey, you just debunked your Catholic mass anyway. He's supposed to sit here forever. Yeah. You got him off his throne and entered a cookie. Come on. That's good. Wow, honest translators. We talked about honest translation retaining content, right? Yeah. They violated content and they violated translation right here. This was completely biased. So they insist that sitting on the throne was forever. But then the one sacrifice, that's not forever because it can be constantly repeated. No, the one sacrifice. The one sacrifice, the one sacrifice is the one that's forever here. This is done forever. You cannot do that again. Jesus Christ cannot die on the cross again. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. So Catholicism demands... A constant sacrifice, but also a constant dethroning. So whether they move the comma before or after, for, uh, before or after uh, that sacrifice mentioned, it doesn't matter. They just uh, violated scripture completely on both counts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, then, when we take the unleavened bread and the grape juice, we understand that is not the literal sacrifice of Christ, but more so as a picture of his sacrifice. So when we're eating it, we're not constantly sacrificing Jesus Christ. We're not constantly making Jesus die on the cross again. More so pictorially, we're bringing up into remembrance of his sacrifice. That's a huge difference. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Notice right here, and the Catholics, they all like to emphasize this in verse 24 about the Lord's Supper. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Uh, verse 26, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, the Catholics will claim that, see, this is why we have to constantly keep doing this because what we're doing is repeating Christ's death. No, they didn't read the word. Notice right here, ye do what? Show. Show. Notice in verse 24, 25, this do in remembrance. Right. It's not a literal transaction that takes place, a literal sacrifice. It's more so of a remembrance. It's more so of a showing. This is the Catholic's favorite verse, verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. 
Verse 29, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning, notice right here, the Lord's body. See, this is God's literal body and blood. And if you refuse to recognize this, he will damn you in hell. So this has to be literal right here. Okay, so one, let's assume that you lose the salvation of your soul over this, okay? Even if we lose the salvation of your soul, that doesn't have to be a literal sacrifice. Because the verse said remembrance and showing. Yeah. And that contradicts Hebrews 10, where he can't sacrifice again. Okay? So maybe, why, how do you not know the verse is saying that you will burn in hell and lose your salvation if you don't remember what Jesus did on the cross for you? All right? So why don't you say it that way? That could be an alternate interpretation, right? But here's another thing is the easy debunking about losing salvation, obviously, is that the damnation, when you look at many times in your Bible or even a common sense dictionary, yeah. damnation simply means condemnation or, you know, punishment. Because if you look at right here in verse 31, this shows that when God uh, punishes or damns or condemns the person, it's all the uh, same thing, because look at verse 30. Look at the damnation. It's not eternal soul. Verse 30, for this cause, right? Verse 29, the damnation, right? For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. See, it's a physical damnation. It's not an eternal soul damnation. It's a bodily damnation, bodily punishment. They lose uh, their health. They get sick. Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Verse 32, but when we are judged, oh, hell, fire, and brimstone. No, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. That's very good. So it points out right here when you do get damned or judged by the Lord himself, he's doing that so that you don't share the same punishment like the lost world does. Right. See, what does that mean? Then you don't get damned in hell. That's the simple explanation. Right. All right, let's go back here. Hebrews chapter 10. So if some of you didn't know that about the Lord's Supper, that's why we take it very seriously. Because, you know, you could get physical damnation. Right. So if one of you start getting food poisoning during the Lord's Supper, I don't know, you know, so can't, I'm just going to say, I'm not going to claim liability on that one, you know. <laughs> no, 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 that ain't going to happen. But anyway, uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, that's why uh, in the Lord's Supper, it's supposed to be a showing. It's supposed to be a remembrance. It's not some literal sacrifice. In verse 15, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that, he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So the Apostle Paul, if he's the author, he's saying that's why the Holy Ghost also is the witness for us. Because the Holy Ghost also mentioned this part about the one sacrifice Jesus Christ gave. That God made a covenant that he's going to make with them, a group of people, after those days, after those particular days, whatever those days are. And God said, I'm going to put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, I'm going to write them. So they're going to know God's ordinances. And then the sins and the iniquities that they have committed, God's not going to remember them anymore. Now, notice right here that the author, he quoted that same passage that he did at Hebrews 8. See that? In Hebrews 8, which is supposed to be a national salvation for Jews, the author switched it to an individualistic salvation. Hebrews 8.10. See that? That's the same verse. You notice that there? Hebrews 8.10, same verse. And then God's not going to remember their sins and iniquities anymore. In verse 12, right? Verse 12. Okay, so why can't we say that, uh, like the Calvinists, that Hebrews 8 is the same thing as Hebrews 10, an individual receiving salvation? 
the author here, he didn't quote verse 11 at Hebrews 8.11. See that? That's a problem. Hebrews 8.11, the author didn't quote that part. What does that mean, Hebrews 8.11? Don't tell anybody about God. Well, obviously, we violated that then, right? See, so that's obviously, Hebrews 8 is not applying to us today, individual salvation. So the author deliberately neglected that part. You notice that. Mm -hmm. He deliberately neglected that part. A second thing is, when you look at Hebrews 8, he intended as a national salvation for Israel. And then when you look at Hebrews 10, that's an individual salvation. Yeah. And he doesn't mention Israel here. Notice he doesn't mention Judah or Israel like he did at Hebrews 8, right? See, so the author here, there is no doubt, he's intending something different to teach here at Hebrews 10. If you think he's arguing for the same thing, then my question is this, why is he repeating something he already mentioned before at Hebrews 8 then? Yeah. See, so he's talking about something different. When we look at uh, Hebrews 10, there is no doubt this is an individual salvation not a national forgiveness of Israel that he's doing. And then the verse he's obviously quoting is from Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. And then he, uh, look at verse 33. Jeremiah 31 and then verse 33. Jeremiah chapter 31 and then verse 33. The Bible points out, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, uh, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Correct? That is what Hebrews 10 is quoting. But notice Jeremiah 31, 33 said the house of Israel. Right? Hebrews 10, 16, he didn't mention that. Not only that, he didn't quote verse 34. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor. He didn't even quote verse 34 because he knows that's not going to work. What's that an example of? That's an example where mid-acts hyper-dispensationalists, you can debunk them on. Mid-acts hyper-dispensationalists insist that if it's doctrinally talking about a different dispensation, you cannot use that for yourself. That is wrong. We Christians believe that even though doctrinally it's applied for a different dispensation, so what the author of Hebrews did is talking about the millennium, right? The nation of Israel receiving a national forgiveness of sins. But nevertheless, he applied a spiritual application, a spiritual lesson from there. Yeah. And he says from that verse, the bottom line is this. I'm not talking about national forgiveness of sins, but the bottom line is that God, he intended to make one day something where their, their sins will be forgiven. So, because God mentioned that before, why not us Christians who receive such a thing? That's the reason why Paul did that. Another example is obviously us preachers. Us preachers, we can take, you can preach out of Jeremiah 31. You can preach out of this right here and not apply a doctrinal application to the millennial nation of Israel. Instead, when we look at that passage, we could probably preach a great message as a spiritual application doctrinally about, hey, uh, why don't we hide God's law in our hearts, right? Why don't we take in remembrance the thing God's done for us and then he forgiven us for our sins, right? Don't we do that? So the author of, he uh, the author of Hebrews does the same thing right here. Now, Here's the funny thing. The mid-acts hyper-dispensationalists, when they see Hebrews 10, 16, here's a problem for them. Hebrews 10, 16, that's a doctrinal application to the nation of Israel. But the author used it right here for individual salvation, not the nation of Israel. Yeah. So what are the mid act hyper-dispensationalists going to do about that? Mm, that's a good point. See, they insist if the verse is talking about doctrinally for a different timeline, you can't use that verse. You Christians cannot use that verse. No, the, uh, this author, Paul, their apostle Paul, did. 
Their apostle Paul, their favorite apostle did that. So he ignored doctrinal application to a dispensation. No, he took that as, hey, this is a verse where we can learn a lesson from. So you have the freedom to do that. If you insist that, okay, no, we can only learn lessons and we are going to apply things only to us doctrinally in our dispensation, then why would God give you 66 books in your Bible? For you to read, to learn, to apply, to apply? Well, you can't apply that to yourself. No, you can apply it, all right? The Bible says, be doers of the word, not hearers, only deceiving your own selves. God wants you to apply. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Right? God wants you to apply his Bible in your heart. Or do you think God only wanted you to apply only 12 books in your Bible written by Paul? Come on, man. <laughs> that don't make sense. So there's an off balance here. There's a hyper. There's an extremism right here. Do we deny doctrinal applications for different dispensations? No, we don't deny that. But I also deny that within those different dispensations that God gives doctrinally, that we can't learn any lessons out of that, that we can't take stuff out of there that we can apply to ourselves. I deny that part. There's obviously so many things that we can apply there. For example, the Jews who complained in the wilderness and then God judged them. Okay, so we know one thing, don't complain, all right? You might make God a little impatient on you. So obviously there are principles that we can apply to ourselves. All right, so this is a great passage where you can use to debunk, and that's a hermeneutical, uh, that's a hermeneutical method, a biblical interpretive method that must be taken account that will help with biblical hermeneutics. A biblical method is not to just take verses where you doctrinally apply it to a dispensation. You can also take it where you can make an individualistic application as a spiritual lesson. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers and that I increased our knowledge of the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.